I think they've all got a Cambridge connection. Reza. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, so I, when I wrote this paper, it was in reaction to a frustration that I had. It's this idea that the Beijing consensus and the China model of development are equally the same. And, and I thought, well, hold on, we're missing the point here. And so in this presentation, um, I'm going to look at what the Beijing consensus might potentially look like, what the China model of development is potentially, and how they're analytically different. But moreover, what we're going to look at is to understand you know, what, what are the lessons we can learn from the philosophical intentionality of the Beijing consensus. And I think that's, uh, that's the sort of, uh, sort of key points we're going to be looking at in the next few minutes. So let's talk first about the Beijing consensus. The Beijing consensus has always been, it's been touted anyways, as, as an alternative economic development model um, that can be used as a guide for reform in developing nations. It's, it's, it's seen, in effect, as an alternative to the Washington consensus. So what is it exactly? Well, we can go back to uh, Ramos' three principles. Um, there's a commitment to innovation and experimentation, a rejection of per capita GDP as a measure of progress, and self-determination. Very, very briefly, I'm going to just speak about these three, and, and so we all have a background in that. The first one, commitment to innovation and experimentation. The idea here, essentially, is that there's no perfect solution or set prescription. In order to outpace, uh, for instance, friction losses of reform, governments must actively innovate in order to address the challenges introduced by changing economic and social environments. So this requires a commitment, essentially, a commitment to constantly tinkering um, and constant change and recognition that different strategies um, are appropriate for different situations. Now, a good example of this might be, if we were to look at the Chinese example, is the one-child policy. Um, although controversial, the one-child policy has been highly successful in reducing the population and sustaining growth and stability. Um, and, so this, and, and, and it's interesting, because despite being, a, a, seeing, being viewed as absurd um, and morally questionable, the fact is that the Beijing consensus emphasizes is that um, there's a pragmatic sort of approach to this. It, it emphasizes that it works in the case of China because they had to reduce the population. So what's the most pragmatic approach to this? Let's introduce a one-child policy. So what we see here is essentially is this commitment to innovation and experimentation that we need to, there's no set prescription to reducing these sorts of uh, attributes here. Now the second aspect is rejection of per capita GDP as a measure of progress. So the Beijing consensus suggests and um, we must have an increased focus on measures such as quality of life and individual equity. So qualitatively, we can suggest that uh, we can measure quality of life perhaps through the UNDP's H Human Development Index, um, guided by SANS capabilities approach. And this provides an alternative view to development equated exclusively with economic growth. It helps us understand poverty is really the deprivation of basic capabilities rather than low income. So examining development in this way um, it emphasizes the realization of substantive results and discredits, for example, uh, situations where income growth benefits only a small portion of the population. Uh, a good example of that is looking at the differences between HDI and GDP um, and seeing how, that, how, how that, those measures vary. So for instance, uh, according to the IMF, uh, GDP at purchasing power parity per capita in South Korea is 25th in the world at $31,714, whereas its HDI rankings is actually 15th in the world. So you can start to see the variations there um, in terms of how HDI is measured versus how uh, GDP um, as measured by purchasing power parity per capita. The point here is simply this. Considering GDP as the single most important factor would undervalue an other nations' other substantive achievements. So in the context of China, there's the uh, five balances that Premier Wang Xiaobao would suggest, right? And that is balancing urban and rural development, balancing development among regions, balancing economic and social determinant, um, development, um, balancing development between individual and nature, and balancing domestic development with opening wider to the outside world. So the Beijing consensus essentially recognizes that an increasing GDP left, with other, with, left without other goals and serious strategies for achieving them will not solve the problems of everyday relevance uh, to the population. So there's that aspect. And the last one is self-determination. The need for developing nations to seek relative independence from outside pressures. 
And you can start to see why this might be an attractive option for many developing nations who may have felt that um, by virtue of accepting aid from, different, from a donor nation, they had to structurally adjust their economies. It was based on that sort of, uh, sort of conditions in, in, in terms of accepting aid. What's interesting in, in, in China's engagement with Africa, you find that aid generally is uh, unrestricted. And, and, and China's investments are attractive to African nations because of this. So China, in other words, does not seek to overtly impose its own priorities on partner nations. Now, my training is actually in sociology and, and development studies. And what I would suggest to you here is based on that, um, is this idea that although China may not overtly impose its, uh, its priorities on partner nations, by virtue of interacting with each other, by virtue of interacting both nation states or um, two nation states interacting with each other, you would find that there is going to be some sort of uh, um, influences there. So although I do say they're not going to overtly impose, there is going to be priorities that are going to be affected by virtue of interaction. But the point still remains that there's self-determination, which is a key component of the Beijing Consensus. So how does this compare to the Washington Consensus then? Well, notwithstanding the three broad principles in the, uh, in, in the Beijing Consensus, one of the major critiques of the Beijing Consensus is that it lacks a codified set of policies and principles and, and policy tools, essentially. To, to, and so it's difficult for the policymaker to suggest that we need to use these particular two, uh, sets of, of policy options for deliberation. So that's one of the major critiques. And here's the sort of utility this is, uh, of the Washington Consensus. And that's why it compares and contrasts so differently with the Washington Consensus, where you find that uh, it's, there are 10 broad policy recommendations. Um, and so what you find is, you know, with the, with the Washington Consensus, there's fiscal policy conservatism. There's a move towards investments in pro-growth, pro-poor services. There's adopting tax reform. There's market-determined interest rates. There's competitive exchange rates, trade liberalization, liberalization of inward FDI, uh, privatized state enterprises, improved property rights, deregulation. You can start to see the list here of policy options one can actually use if you're a nation state and is attempting to develop using uh, these tools. The Beijing consensus, you don't get this. And so it's difficult for the policymaker to suggest that, well, um, we can use these sort of basket of tools to improve our, our development. Um, so that's the sort of major differences between the consens Washington consensus and the Beijing consensus. Now, what I'm particularly interested at, I mean, called in that background, what I'm particularly interested at is why do we conflate the Beijing consensus with the Chinese model of development? And what I'm going to argue is that they're very different sort of ideas. Now, in the search for concrete sets of principles and policy tools, the literature does have this tendency to conflate the Beijing consensus with the Chinese model of development. Now, the Chinese model of development, I would argue, is shorthand to discuss the role of the state in developing the nation. In, in other words, the Chinese model of development called within that conversation is the role of institutions and the role of the state in economic development. In the Chinese model of development, there's a strong corporate estate, whereby the modern Chinese state has traditionally affected every major aspect of domestic society. And even with, and even with the growing liberalization of the economy, you find that the state's playing a strong role in directing that sort of uh, economic activities. And what you find is that corporatist arrangements in China have a long lifespan since the state can use a combination of control and suppression to manage social groups. So put differently, you could say that the experiences of the People's Republic of China suggest that authorita authoritarianism and economic restructuring can, co can coexist. And this method of development has been highly successful. No other nation has averaged a growth rate more than 9% over the last 25 years. Mind you, they slowed down to about 7% now, but still, it's remarkable growth. So what you find is this dichotomy, essentially, this dichotomy between the Western regulatory state and the Eastern developmental state. And this has become greater, more acute. In the Western version, you find that government has refrained from interfering in the marketplace, except to ensure certain limited goals. Whereas China's intervened actively in the economy in order to guide or promote particular substantive goals. So what we can suggest is this. In the last three decades, um, the China's model of development um, for the most part, has been the result of a highly specific circumstance in terms of size and thus the, uh, the development of the domestic economy, in terms of the abundance of labor, um, and also in terms of the, 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 the presence of an effective uh, state institutions with strong leadership. 
which we can suggest is cooperative in nature. So it is highly specific, and that's and so the model development um, is caught within that sort of framework. If I was to give you a, a very succinct way of putting it to you, is that the Chinese model development should be analytically distinct for this reason. The Beijing consensus is, a, is attempting to get to the idea of an alternative global organization, whereas the China's model of development is a strategy that answers to particular needs of Chinese society. So that's the major analytical differences there. Now, so some further proof. I would suggest to you that the Beijing consensus should be seen as a statement of intent. It ought to be seen as a philosophical movement towards an ultra-pragmatic view of development policy. It is a pragmatic adaptation to circumstance rather than the adoption of new sets of principles. And this is contrary to models of development which provides a subset of policy prescriptions at the policymaker's disposal, such as the Washington Consensus we just spoke about, or fundamentalist adherence to a particular economic tradition, such as neoliberalism, Marxism, or political economy uh, theories of exploitation dependency. The philosophical intentionality of the Beijing Consensus is reflected in the infamous words of Deng Xiaoping. I do not care if it's a white cat or a black cat, he says. It's a good cat so long as it catches mice. It's a very pragmatic view. So the Beijing consensus inherently recognizes that each development scenario has a potential set of challenges that may require unique solutions factoring the social, economic, and political environments. At this juncture, many, I mean, this is, this is something that most of us in the room might agree with. But there are some serious consequences catching mice without prejudice. And what I would suggest to you is this. By virtue of having this ultra-pragmatic view towards developing a particular nation, um, you find that uh, it's going to lack moral appeal. So the potential attraction, let's go back a step. The potential attraction for many developing nations to adopt the Beijing Consensus is, has been due to the tangible economic and, and political benefits rather than intangible moral appeals. The Beijing consensus lacks moral appeal because it's guided entirely by pragmatism, which by definition is behavior disciplined by neither a set of values nor established principles. And this can be an affront to our sensibilities. While the Beijing consensus may be potentially attractive to developing nations, it undermines engagement with the West using forms of soft power. Its adoption may potentially lack respect for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. In, in other words, if you catch mice by violating political and civil rights, other nations may object. So what sort of future directions then can we have? Um, there are three directions the Beijing consensus can go. First, it's to continue to confuse the, the Chinese model of development with the Beijing consensus. And here we see individuals who have come out in the last few months, uh, for instance, John Williamson, who just came over a paper, um, suggesting that he just assumes that the Beijing consensus basically refers to the Chinese way of doing things. And the critiques would follow suit thereafter. And so what you would find is that people would, would attempt to conflate critiques of China's development experiences with the consensus. And I think this is a red herring. The second sort of uh, direction that might potentially occur is that if we potentially accept an analytical difference between the China model and the Beijing consensus, there can be continued discrediting of the consensus on the basis of the fact that it lacks policy prescriptions. So what's the utility in, in, in having a consensus? What's the utility in having the Beijing consensus if it does not give you um, a, a set of policy prescriptions? So it lacks that sort of utility for the policymaker. And the third set of directions that may occur with the Beijing consensus is that a nation, we might embrace the notion that policies ought to be tailored for specific circumstances that each nation requires an individualized path, and there ought to be a need for flexibility in solving multifarious problems. In this vein, it, it, may be, it may be the case that we ought to continue to adopt many of the policy prescriptions of the Washington Consensus, again, if pragmatism dictates that. Um, ironically, pragmatism is going to allow for diversity in the Chinese context. And I suspect by embracing this ultra-pragmatic uh, uh, sort of view that, 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 that's fostered through the Beijing consensus, it's going to become quite apparent to Chinese leadership, um, if not apparent already, that China should pursue further market-oriented economic reforms, as well as increased political reforms, essentially moving away from this status, sort of corporatist sort of relationship.